Step 4. State tomography. So, how do we find out the state of an random quantum system? In the previous step, we have seen that even if we start with a known ideal uh, system, it, it can undergo, undergo some coherent or incoherent non-deterministic errors. So, uh, in the end, we get something that we're not quite sure what it is, and we have to have a way of uh, finding out what the state of the system is. And that's the job of state tomography. So we start with an unknown in the case of a single qubit 2 by 2 matrix, and what we are trying to do is we are trying to uh, identify what these ma matrix elements are. This row 0, 0, row 0, 1, and so on. So what we do, we can start by realizing that any state of a single qubit matrix can be written in the following form. It's the sum of the identity matrix plus this inner product between two vectors r and sigma. R represents the block vector. These are just three numbers, Rx, Ry, and Rz. Whereas the vector sigma is the vector of the three Pauli matrices x, y, and z. And in fact, if we substitute these two back into our expression for rho, we find out that rho can be written in terms of the block vector components Rz, Ry, and Rx. For example, if we know what the rz is, the z component of the block vector, immediately we know what's, uh, what are the diagonal uh, elements of the density matrix. And if we want to find out what are the off-diagonal elements, we need the values of rx and ry. So the question now is, in order to find out the state, we have to find out what are the block vector components. So how do we do that? Well we can uh, measure the expectation value of the Pauli operators. And here is why. Let's consider what the expectation value is for the Pauli x uh, operator. We know the expectation value can be written as the trace of the operator times the state. So if we substitute for our state rho, our previous expression in terms of the inner product between the block vector and the Pauli uh, matrices, we get the following expression. Now we're just going to multiply everything by the Pauli x um, operator, and we get the following sum. We've got x plus rx times x squared plus ry of x times y, and so on. And now comes the step where we realize that the Pauli matrices are actually traceless. So if we take the trace of the first term, trace of the Pauli x matrix, that is equal to zero. Also, if we take two traceless matrices and we take their product, the product is also traceless. So the third and the fourth terms, they also vanish. Their traces are zero. So the only term that we are left with is the x squared term. And we know that the x squared is just equal to the identity matrix. And the trace of the identity matrix is equal to two. Therefore, we can say that the expectation value of the Pauli x uh, operator is equal to rx. So this is how we find out the components of the block vector. We have to measure the expectation values of the Pauli operators. And there we go. So this is the protocol for uh, state tomography for a single qubit. First, we prepare many copies of the unknown state row. Many in usually means thousands. Then we measure some portion of these states in the x basis, some portion in the y basis, and some in the z basis, and we obtain the estimates of the block vector given by these bars over here. So we, we estimate rx and we write it rx bar, ry bar, rz bar. And then finally we check that the state is correctly normalized. Now these uh, um, estimates of the block vector are not the actual values. Therefore, it may happen that the length of that vector is actually larger than one. If that happens, all we have to do, we just renormalize by dividing by the length of the vector given by these estimates. And if it already it's less than one or equal to one, we leave it as it is. So now, why do we need so many copies? So consider that we have n measurements in the x basis what we get are n outcomes. And each of these outcomes, x1, x2, up to xn, is either equal to the plus one or to minus one. From this, we can compute the estimate for the rx bar, the x component of the block vector. 
and that's just given by the arithmetic mean over here. For example, if half of them are equal to plus 1, half of them are equal to minus 1, then our estimate uh, Rx bar is going to be equal to 0. Now, the larger the number of copies is, then this estimate becomes a Gaussian variable with mean that's given by the true Rx, the true uh, x component of the block vector. And the standard deviation will be given by this following expression. It's the standard deviation of a single uh, measurement of the x variable in the x basis divided by square root of n. So we see that the larger uh, copies that we have, this overall standard deviation is going to decrease as square root of n. And also we can just forget about this uh, delta x, the standard deviation for a single measurement. We can just uh, assume the worst case scenario where it's equal to 1. So then the standard deviation of the estimate that we obtain after measuring, um, measuring n times is given by 1 over square root of n. And this, this shows you that the more you measure um, in a given basis, the better estimate you get. The higher confidence you have that your estimate is actually close to the real value. Now, how do we perform state tomography on multi-qubit states? Well, again, we can express our multi-qubit state rho in the following form, where we've got a product of some expectation value of uh, Pauli operators times the Pauli operators themselves. So here, we, in this notation, we are including the identity operator uh, and we denote it by sigma zero. So again, the game is about measuring these expectation values. So how many measurements do we actually need? How many terms in this sum are there? Well, luckily there's not that many and we can actually write them all out. And these are all 16 of them. We have the first term where these two are j and k are both zero. That's given by i tensor product i. Then the next term is i tensor x, i tensor y, and so on until we reach z tensor z. But this first term, i tensor i, or sigma zero times sigma zero, doesn't really represent the measurement. So we can take it out. So what we have to do, we have 15 different measurement settings. So how about if we go to higher number of qubits? This is the, this is the table that shows you the scaling of all the uh, measurement settings. So we saw that for one qubit, we need three measurement settings. For two qubits, we need 15. For three qubits, turns out we need 255. For n qubits, we need four to the power of n minus one. So this should convince you that state tomography is a very resource hungry process. If we want full knowledge of the state, we have to perform many, many measurements in all of these exponentially many uh, measurement settings. So state tomography is really suitable only for small, uh, small systems. One qubit, two qubits, perhaps three qubits. But often we are not interested in the full information about the full density matrix. And this can lead to some resource savings. For example, if we only want to find out the fidelity of a state, we can do the following. In quantum networks, we often want to distribute a known state. For example, one of the Bell pairs given by phi plus, which is a superposition of 0, 0, plus 1, 1. So let's compute what's the expression for the fidelity of such a state. In the end, after we distribute it, we will have a two qubit state in some unknown state. And just plugging it into, into the expression for the fidelity, we get the following expressions. Most of the uh, 16 terms will cancel, and with what we are left with are only four terms. So the fidelity of this unknown two qubit state with respect to the phi plus bell pair is given by the sum of one and then these three expectation values. So it shows you that all you have to do is you have to measure both qubits in the x uh, basis, then in the y basis, and then in the z basis in order to get estimates of these expectation values, and therefore an estimate of the fidelity. And this is a quite a substantial saving. You go from 15 measurement settings just to three. But really, it depends on the scenario at hand and in whether you're interested in the full density matrix or just the fidelity.